already know. Um, he's at University of Pennsylvania. Um, so all of our papers are going to be talking about climate, capital, and crisis. Um, and it's a pretty good set of folks for doing that. So uh, take it away, Daniel. Thanks. Great. OK, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, this, is, this presentation is sort of like my attempt to think together a few different things that I'm working out. Um, sort of in the, in the spirit of Capital Volume 2, where Marx goes and resize the equations from the different perspective of the various components, I'm going to try to do like the most you can do with consumption um, to try to think about capitalism and climate change and inequality and urbanization all, all together. And um, I'm going to do it by kind of thinking, thinking about it in three different ways, so three cuts into the politics of consumption uh, in cities. And we're going to kind of progress from a kind of more site-based within city analytic to a kind of more global uh, planetary or at minimum kind of urban, non-urban uh, perspective. Um, so OK, you know, uh, when I prepared this sort of round of presentation a while ago, it was necessary to talk about the difficulty of climate change and the importance of carbon. But I feel like the last few weeks, especially if you've been on the news, has made, has made it very clear. But the central point is that greenhouse gas emissions, and we can think about carbon as a kind of metonym for that, are the kind of fundamental driver for crisis, I think, in the 21st century, certainly for the first few decades. So the challenge then is to kind of get a handle on that. And I argue that we need to follow the carbon into the viscera of social life, that that's the kind of method that sets up our analysis of, um, of capitalism. And to give you a preview, the kind of the way that I've come to think about the relationship between carbon and social life is working through this concept of collective consumption that I've kind of borrowed and, and revitalized from Manuel Castells. Um, and the idea is to sort of think about collective consumption struggles, which are struggles over kind of public goods and public services in urban spaces and potentially non-urban spaces, um, struggles that often have different banners that ultimately boil down to the question of, of living well. So typically in cities now, they revolve around housing because housing is such a, a crucial issue uh, because of rising rents and for all these reasons. But sometimes the struggle over collective consumption will be in the, in the vein of transit or police brutality or something like that. So, and it's not to say that all politics around living well are good. Like I think you would say that quality of life policing, quote unquote, is a kind of collective consumption struggle uh, led from, from above. So the topical focus of collective consumption struggles changes. But I want to argue that there is this kind of consistent relationship between carbon and then struggles that, that folks are leading uh, in order to live well. OK, so let's um, dive in here. Um, we'll just skip this for now. OK, so the first cut is this question of housing and climate change and social movements in cities. So I want to start here. Um, this is where I've done the most work. This is building on my, my dissertation research and some articles and texts that have come out of that. Um, and so the first thing in terms of following the carbon into the viscera of social life is to say, OK, what has been this big agenda around urban climate politics? If you think about what urban climate politics have been about, uh, forget the kind of smart city stuff, but the kind of core issue in terms of reorganizing the city to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which all kinds of NGOs and, and groups are supporting. It's about changes to housing and land use and transit and increasing the buildings. And the idea is that by kind of through forms of smart densification, you can lower carbon emissions while also improving uh, quality of life. So there's been this agenda developing over the last two to three decades to transform cities to lower carbon emissions through smart densification, which puts people closer to where they work, closer to their social services, things like daycare, uh, closer to leisure opportunities. So this is a kind of utopian, pseudo-utopian vision for the, for the low carbon uh, and the no carbon city. Now, uh, this is generally proposed kind of by green policy elite types, um, folks like Meg Bloomberg. And this, kind of, this conversation tends to ignore the fact that there is also a wave of insurgent social movements, um, particularly responding to the crisis of inequality in cities, that have been fighting over the exact same thing, over land use, over housing, over transit, um, but without talking about carbon and frequently without talking about climate change. So we already see this potentially this kind of, a kind of category error if we assign environmental politics only to people who talk in terms of the environment. But if we follow the carbon into the viscera of social life, we see that there are all kinds of climate actors, many of them uh, implicit or accidental, who are also acting on this. Um, I want to move a bit quickly through this to get to the next parts, but basically in my research in Sao Paulo, New York, I essentially argue that this idea we have that there is a kind of neoliberal and global carbon governance landing in cities 
that is then encountering a kind of local social justice struggle is the wrong way to think about what's happening. That we should instead think about rival urban ecological projects, but democratic ecologies uh, versus luxury ecologies. Uh, where in the case of the democratic ecologies, these kind of right to the city struggles, struggles over affordable housing, don't always talk or think about climate change, although increasingly they are. But what they're trying to do to the city in terms of affordable housing and central locations would have a major carbon uh, benefit. So um, what's interesting about these housing movements, and this is very much true in Sao Paulo, but in, you know, in cities elsewhere, is that to a large extent, these housing movements are actually women's movements. Um, and they're very often led by women of color. Um, this is actually a point made very strongly by Peter Marcuse and David Madden in their book um, called In Defense of, of Housing. Um, but it's something that you find in the empirical research I don't think is talked about that much. So this is uh, Elo Hegina. She's one of my informants in the housing movement in Sao Paulo. And she once said to me in this kind of striking way, she said, the reason, Daniel, that so many women are the leaders in the housing movements in Sao Paulo, she said, because every Brazilian woman holds in her heart the idea that her, you know, her, her man will ultimately leave her. And so the women fight for the home, uh, and the men go off and fight in the union or just get drunk or something. Um, and it is actually, it's, it's really interesting that the, the movement in Brazil is that there is this thin leadership of men quite in, in the kind of earlier founding generation. But as you see the development of leadership over time, you would expect to see, I think, the full leadership of this as being really a women's movement. And when I was visiting with a number of occupations this past July, when you would ask, and I hadn't done this before, ask sort of in a group of, of movement organizers about this fact that it's essentially a women's movement, the men will say things like, oh, well, the women are the strongest, they're the bravest, they're the most powerful. They're themselves kind of being revolutionized by this women's uh, struggle. So um, in analytic terms, I think this gets us some, to think really about the links between you know, social reproduction uh, and collective consumption. Um, Alyssa's helped push me to think about social reproduction as a category that's, that's central here. Um, if we think in terms of urban struggles in the US, again, uh, you know, think about Dolores Hayden, her article, like, what would a non-sexist city look like from the late 70s, is itself prefigures the ent entire conversation on a low-carbon city with a conversation about density that is really all about care, care work and possibilities for collective living uh, in the city. So, um, so I think, you know, as I was saying, we can think about it kind of rival ecologies, we can think about democratic ecologies as often being women movement, women's movements, movements of people of color, fighting over housing. And actually this movement uh, that ELO is, is uh, a key organizer of has started to talk about climate change as well as a key part of the housing struggle. So it's not just a question of imposing analytic categories from above, but when you, on, you go on the ground as well, you find housing movements have taken notice of the fact that they are fighting over the terrain of ecological politics in cities, and they are increasingly talking about them too. So this notion that the social and ecological divide is of course very much old fashioned in terms of the grant, and obviously in radical geography as well that's a slightly more exotic part of the world. Um, okay, um, so I argue that you essentially see these parallels between Sao Paulo and New York and essentially between cities in the global south and the global north. Um, all right, so that first cut is this idea of this kind of place-specific battle over density, right? The idea that battles over density are essentially rival camps in climate politics that are emerging in cities all around the world. Now I want to kind of move kind of halfway toward thinking about the relationship between urban struggles and, and space and consumption in cities and kind of planetary ecologies, global ecologies. And this is gonna move into a kind of quantitative moment here, um, which I'm doing with the help of people who are a lot better at math uh, than I am. So the fundamental issue is that when we count up carbon emissions in cities, uh, we typically use what I call a snow globe accounting method, which is that you just count up all the emissions that physically take place in the city plus whatever uh, comes out of the power plant that feeds electricity into the city. Now this makes density seem like an awesome thing. So my laptop, I plug it in, those emissions are attributed to me. The emissions that it took to produce the laptop and to, and to ship it to me are attributed to uh, somewhere in China, let's say, or a series of places. Um, you know, this is a little bit actually problematic. If you look at post-industrial cities, liberal cities, where people congratulate themselves for their low carbon emissions because of their density, if you actually factor in consumption, you get something like two to four times as high a carbon footprint as you do if you don't. And this is important because simply at the level of understanding the relationship between affluence and carbon, if you use a snow globe method in a post-industrial city devoted to consumption, which is the economic model of affluent cities, uh, then you are essentially telling a very useful lie, which makes wealth come out looking a lot better than it is. Um, 
So in addition to this kind of snow globe or territorial emissions accounting method, we can also think about consumption-based uh, accounting, where you attribute to the final consumer all of the emissions that go into the production of a good. Um, now, if you are you know, a good Marxist, you'll be very suspicious about this concept of like household or individual consumption. And uh, you know, I will address some or all of these suspicions over the course of the rest of this presentation, slash uh, the whole day. OK, so um, <laughs> the thing about world ecology or planetary urbanization, uh, planetary urbanization in particular, I, you know, I studied with Neil, um, Neil Brenner at NYU and have urged him to, to think about carbon a lot more than he has, but that's OK, he's not even here to defend himself, but so above we have one of these kind of classic planetary urbanization visualizations, and actually, lo and behold, it looks quite a bit like these visualizations that show the trade in essentially embodied carbon, um, and in particular between newly industrializing countries and China, especially uh, in the United States and, and Western Europe. Um, but we can break this down to the level of the city, into the neighborhood, into the household. So I'm kind of pushing this with a, forward with a new group at Penn called the Socio-Spatial Carbon Collaborative, cleverly designed to look pseudo-scientific. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. And the basic concept here to determine household carbon footprints, which we then localize uh, with pretty sophisticated math into, into neighborhoods, is you need to, on the one hand, understand everything about household consumption, all the different ways in which households consume, which involves a lot of data harmonization, and then you know what the carbon emissions are implied by that consumption based on a whole bunch of research that other folks have done. So X dollars spent on a computer equals roughly X amount of carbon, or spent on air travel, or what have you. This yields a kind of household carbon footprint, which you can then break down to the per capita level. Um, okay, I'm not going to go into this crazy math, but um, it involves like a lot of steps. Um, okay, so in terms of again, kind of coming back to this kind of social analytic payoff, um, the you know the intellectual work that went along with the whole Bloomberg age of urban climate politics is really advanced this notion of density and beautifully visualized in the cover of this sort of famous book by David Owen, a New Yorker writer called The Green Metropolis. Right? It's, a sky, it's an apartment building on a bicycle, the lifestyle we should all desire. All it's missing is a basket with organic fruit. Um, <laughs> and um, now we all know good graphic design, you don't put text over images, but the person who made this, this graphic that I borrowed from the internet did do that. But what it says is the future of real sustainability will look a lot more like midtown Manhattan than rural Vermont. That is the slogan, like in a handbasket, for this idea of you know, density and affluent liberal uh, post-industrial metropolises as the vision of, of sustainability that we all want. Okay, so I think remains in the air this question, right? I was talking to you about democratic ecologies and density. How does this play out in cities? So if you take New York, here's a map um, that we produced using Kevin, my research partner's data, for an atlas of New York City. Um, well, there's no buzzer here, but so I'm not sure how familiar you guys are, all are with New York, but basically, so that sort of sliver in the middle, that quite dark sliver, that's, that's Manhattan. And the darker the shade of color, the higher the emissions per capita in any given zip code. What you see actually is that in neighborhoods of Manhattan, Upper East Side, Upper West Side, Midtown, uh, West Village, uh, very, very high emissions per capita. To give you a sense, those are almost as high as in some of the most sprawling and affluent suburbs across the country. Okay, so um, this is not, has nothing to do with work. These are just traced to the residents of these neighborhoods. The kind of really lower carbon, light gray neighborhoods are this kind of crescent moon shape of largely um, low and middle income neighborhoods, uh, largely people of color. These are the front lines of gentrification. They're the New York City neighborhoods that are not only uh, you know, inhabited by, by working class people, but also quite tightly connected to transit and very often anchored by public housing, which is hard to see here, but the NYCHA buildings are indicated with little yellow uh, dots. There's a whole political story superimposed on it we won't get into right now. Um, uh, so these neighborhoods, which you know, being subject to gentrification in New York, it, you know, the most likely, the more likely, uh, sorry, the more subject you are to gentrification, the more neighborhood is in transition, the more likely you are to be vulnerable to a stop and frisk. It's not the richest or the poorest neighborhoods, but the neighborhoods that are being gentrified that are the most heavily policed. Um, these are the neighborhoods that are kind of in, in self-defense, and in many cases, the whole agenda of gentrification, that image of the city, is defended in terms of the kind of combination of the post-industrial economy, a knowledge economy, a low-carbon economy. In fact, what that's really about is turning the city into a playground for the wealthy, which has an enormous carbon footprint, rendered invisible by, by sloppy data uh, collection. Um, okay, now what is causing these, these emissions? So let's break it down for a moment. Um, Amber alert. Flash for a moment. Oh, sorry, we're all getting, yeah. Okay, watch out. <laughs> Open out on a water shed right now. Okay, so. So it's driving, so we can actually now go and break down some of the factors that are driving these emissions, um, which I think are relevant. So 
gasoline emissions, really interesting. Staten Island, which is like a suburban enclave, very high gasoline emissions. Um, Manhattan, not so much. Um, if you look at other products, which in this statistical rendering actually refers to goods and services, you see those wealthy neighborhoods in Manhattan and wealthy Brooklyn really pop out. Um, when you look at other transport, which is essentially airplanes, uh, again, you really see Manhattan pop out. When you look at utilities, much more even. And essentially what this is showing is that these snow globe emissions, um, the utilities and the gasoline, don't actually get you very far in terms of understanding what is really driving emissions uh, in urban spaces. It really is the consumption of goods and services that's kind of really accelerates at, with, at high amounts of wealth. And it's also about this kind of luxury uh, lifestyle of flying around the world, uh, you know, basically on, on vacation. Because um, business transactions won't be captured uh, in, in the same way. So um, you see this sort of fundamental issue with, with wealth. Um, okay, so let's get to the third cut. So I think we've seen that the, the democratic ecologies turn out to be more ecological, actually, than the luxury ecologies. And, I, and we're starting to see ways in which even the city itself, through the data, through quantification, you can start to think about the relationship between urban rival ways of living well in the city and global ecological kind of well-being or, or, or global pollution. Um, and we have to kind of tear apart the sources of data that have been most convenient to those in power in which they have, of course, reproduced. Um, the, the third kind of cut I'm gonna cut, get, at, get at briefly is what happens when, when climate politics, instead of thinking about them scaling up from the city to the state to the nation, to think about them branching out. This is my visual pun here. Branch out. Um, <laughs> And the idea is this whole question of, of commodity chain organizing, anti-extraction organizing, food sovereignty uh, politics. There are a whole series of politics, some of which are named environmental and some of which are, are not, where you have these urban-rural linkages put into political question. So I think we can think of productively as being urban. Um, what kind of got me onto this was realizing that in New York City, uh, where I also lived when I was doing my research, the, the f same folks who were organizing against Keystone were also people who'd come up through Occupy Wall Street, come up through fights around things like social services and housing and labor within New York City. But there's actually a link between the kind of snow globe collective consumption community in terms of political infrastructure and then this kind of urban, rural, anti-extraction organizing. The idea of blockadia is another sort of snow globe fiction, which is that only out there in particular vulnerable communities is they're organizing against extraction. What actually makes that whole project viable is the linkages between people who are living, whether they're in indigenous communities or on ranches in, in um, Nebraska or so on, linkages between them and folks in cities who are publicizing those struggles and who are providing a certain kind of infrastructure. And there are, of course, a lot of tensions between those groups, which no one in the movement really wants to talk about. But I've become increasingly interested in this question of what is the link between the political infrastructure of the people trying to live well in cities and not in cities when they're coming together to fight over extraction. Um, so I think with the story of Peace on XL is very much an urban story that's not being told. Um, you, you saw, especially around um, No Dapple, uh, in places like Philadelphia, a large contingent of sort of Black Lives Matter movement for Black Lives organizers getting involved in these politics. Um, and you see something a bit different in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, where you have on the one hand the kind of the people who are organizing with the landless movement around food sovereignty, then a very different class uh, characteristic to movements against things like dams in the Amazon, which is very much like a largely upper middle class struggle in cities uh, with these kind of typical environmentalist networks. So I think there's like a certain amount of richness and difference there, uh, case to case. If we think about clean energy, and this is where I want to kind of move us toward a conclusion, clean energy politics also involve actually quite a bit of difficult lifestyle issues and quality of life issues for people in rural areas. Um, both wind power and then wind turbines themselves and power lines have elicited a huge amount of resistance. Right-wing websites love to talk about this. It's a bit less discussed um, on the left. To produce the same amount of energy as a fossil fuel and infrastructure, wind and solar take 10 to 100 times more space in the landscape. Um, power lines are a huge problem. Germany has just spent $9 billion to bury uh, several hundred kilometers of power lines from the north to the south. And we're only kind of getting started. There's a, a question of like, is, if blockadia is true for pipelines, isn't, it, isn't there something also to the fact that rural communities are also often facing kind of imposed corporate arrivals where a company will say, here we're gonna put a bunch of windmills, here we're gonna put a bunch of power lines. Can we think about the kind of, you know, the energy transition that we wanna have is also having to, to somehow embody a politics of urban rural organizing and kind of community building 
um, that really responds to these issues of infrastructure imposition. So, you know, not doing with clean energy what was done with, with fossil fuels. And again, the benefits typically of clean energy are right urban consumers. And the landscapes in which these things are imposed are often poor, rural, often politically conservative uh, areas on whom a new energy infrastructure is being imposed. And I think our kind of good guy, bad guy story about fossil fuels has maybe made it a bit difficult to think about the organizing challenges, but also you know, opportunities uh, that come with a whole new energy system. So um, again, these were kind of the three cuts. And again, just to conclude, I think when you follow the carbon into the vista of social life, you see that the, the fight over well-being, the fight over living well, has a huge has huge implications for climate change. Um, and I think they are they are a place where if you want to understand political struggle and political organizing and what's possible in the decades ahead, we really need to focus more on this arena. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Martin Sanson. Uh, I'm from uh, St. Paul University in Ottawa, a very, very tiny university of about a thousand students. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, climate change and conflict in the capitalist world ecology. So I'm doing my PhD in conflict studies, uh, and this is part of my dissertation, and as we'll see, it's kind of a big critique of the general narratives in uh, conflict studies. So um, probably not going to get a lot of funding for future research, <laughs> but hey, it's part of life, I guess. So <coughs> I will start. Um, over the past four or five decades, uh, the study of conflict has given rise to many ways of problematizing conflict. One of them is the climate conflict nexus a broad category which includes diverse ways of conceptualizing the complex dynamics between climate change and ecolog 